po person. Okay, here we go. All right, Kathy, go. Oh, it's me. All right, so. <laughs> hey, Kathy, can you let people in? Uh, Kate, can Kate do that? I can, I'm doing Okay. Great. Hold on. Just a moment, please, as Kathy says. One moment, um, please. This is a big moment for you guys. Welcome to those who have never been here because we have our own theme song. Well, it's the end of the week. Now, where you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday, so come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We got a presenter that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday, we're on the loose. We'll be the train, you be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes <laughs> and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. Well, it's the uh, end of the week. I did it again. Gosh. Okay, there we go. Uh, it's, right. it's Friday the 13th. That's why. Oh, but I did it last week too, so I have no excuse. Okay, so when we get to chat, <laughs> that'll be later. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I need two things. I need like a tinted lip gloss for the winter. Okay. Not Burt's Bees. Gotcha. And some sort of something for my skin as well. I'm using oh. uh, plant workshops. Plant workshop salve or hemp oil is Her, yeah. She doesn't have hemp oil anymore. She yep. has a beautiful lavender oil, but um, yep. I think I need a little bit more. But anyway. Kathy, do you think people think that we're like a um, body care show now? We are a body care show. We're talking about body caring care. for your body. Your soul, your mind, your and your creative impulses. Right. So welcome. Welcome to Feedback Friday. <laughs> um, as you all know, I'm Kathy Hottori. I'm the president and owner of Botanical Colors. And today we have a show uh, that's going to be focusing on our favorite color, indigo. Um, but before we get to that, let's see, what else am I supposed to tell you? Oh, yeah. Um, with me helping out is my co-pilot, Kate Rosendale. Hello, Kate. Hi. Side by side here in the studio. And then we realized that we were both gonna have to wear masks and that it was just gonna be really tough. So I'm here in the studio. Kate's in her safe home. Um, hope you are all as well staying safe. It's getting kind of crazy out there with the virus. So um, mask up if you don't, if it's not mandated in your state, it should be, but do mask up, it does help. Um, we get more in, in more questions about indigo than any other dye. So what we decided to do is update our online information because the recipe that we have is probably from 2012 in a workshop that I took, that I taught in uh, Taos, New Mexico, which was like, this is a really super magical place if you ever get a chance to go down there, it's really cool. Um, and at that time it was relatively new and we were kind of just struggling through exactly how to make it work because most of us had either come from um, a fermentation vat experience or using fairly aggressive chemistry in order to create uh, indigo vats. Even if it was with natural indigo, we were you know pouring all the other stuff in there. So this was a new idea and over the past few years we've actually kind of made adjustments to the recipe, but really didn't do much updating. And so Kate and I decided that it was high time that we did a couple of things. Um, one was to look at the, the um, indigo, how it's being used in terms of each vat, and then also do a comparison. So that's what um, we're gonna talk about today. And before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. One is, um, of course, thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's Friday the 13th. Thank you. The election is over and decided. Thank you. Um, I guess Georgia's next, please. Uh, and so, yeah, 
it, it's been a super, I think, anxiety ridden time and at least a few things are now sort of settling out. So it's a good time to relax into blue uh, and learn a little bit. Um, Amy is going to be monitoring the call. Everyone's on mute uh, until we get to chat, no, until we get to the end of the session, and then we open it up to say howdy, hi um, to everyone. And we're recording this call, so you will be able to reference it in the future. Um, and so we're anxious to get started. And what else? Oh, any questions that you have that you need references and or additional information, we put that in the chat. We forward the chat um, and the video link to you so that you have all the information that is being uh, discussed in this um, session. Okay, so I'm just gonna say to our guest, um, Kathy um, Hattori, is that it? And uh, <laughs> she's gonna talk about Indigo. Why, thank you. Thank you very much, Botanical Colors, for having me on. Oh my God, we're gonna lose people on this one. We're this gonna is... lose you guys. I am just so like, I'm beyond wrecked, okay? I'm trying to be happy, but it is just, a, it's been a, a roller coaster. But the great thing that we did, um, I actually have a slideshow, but I'll just tell you what we did and then I'll show you the slides. I think there's eight of them. And then we'll go through the samples because I have a second camera set up that shows each of the, the different things we did and some of the discoveries we made. Um, so just some background information. We've been making one, two, three vats a long time. And quite frankly, I, I was always making the fructose vats and they were good. And then I made a henna vat a few years ago and I liked it better, but I could not tell you why. And then we've tried iron vats a couple of times and we really liked them, but then they were really, really, we were not really able to control them very well. So then we, they kind of fell out of favor. Plus I personally do not like iron. So it was tough to get into an iron vat, but I have to tell you, if you are like a dark indigo junkie, iron's a pretty, it's definitely not even the gateway to dark colors. It is the dark color. Um, so you can get over your iron distaste and use it, but it is only for um, cellulose and bast fibers. It is not for silk. It is not for wool. Definitely not for cashmere. So um, that's just kind of a quick overview. I'm going to share my screen, God willing. Uh, yeah. Click to exit full screen. Oh yeah, let's see if I hit present. It's gonna start at the beginning. No, not starting at the beginning. All right, I'm gonna stop the share guys. I've already done a fail here. Kathy, I think we practiced enough for this that you should have gotten this right. I'm really disappointed. Yeah, I know, just load it on Amy. There's only a couple people looking, just play it cool. Yeah, only 230 of them. Okay, I'm gonna start from there. Uh, I think I'm in the, nope. Yes, that's the start. Okay, so um, we're talking about the one, two, three vat. I'm not talking about a fermentation vat. I'm not talking about instant indigo, um, skumo, woad balls, whatever else your creative minds have thought about, I'm talking about the one, two, three vat. And so what I really love about this vat is that you can actually get different colors using different reducing agents. And so when I'm talking about the reducing agent, what I'm talking about is either fructose, henna, or iron. There are other reducing agents out there. You can um, boil up pear peels and make a fructose liquid and use that as a reducing agent. Um, I'm convinced that leftover cranberries, because they're high, in, anything that's high in antioxidants is probably a pretty good reducing agent. So um, Osage balls, um, leftover cranberry, you know, cranberries from, from picking cranberries, uh, things like that could be really interesting, but you'll need to do the experiments. What is it that I'm hitting? Oh yeah, here. You're right, I didn't practice. Okay, so, um, oops. 
This is um, a fructose fat. And so what we did was we made four different fats and we made them um, with exactly the same amount of indigo and we only changed the reducing agent. So we had a fructose fat, we had a vat that we call shakalata because instead of dissolving each ingredient separately and putting it into the vat, you actually take all the powders and mix them so that it looks like kind of a gray blue powder and then you add that into your vat. And that is the technique that um, Kristen Arts from Scrambles Quilts introduced to me uh, last year, I think it was. And it, it's quite simple. So it's really great if you're kind of in a hurry and just want to not have to have three containers, three things of hot water and just um, go. But there is a difference, a slight difference. So um, hopefully you'll be able to see that with our second camera when we go to the details. Um, what, these, what these represent are, we have something that we call a fresh vat. And what we mean by that is that we actually made the vat, let it cool till it was cool enough for us to put our hands in it and use it. And then we dipped. And so the first um, representation on your left is a three one minute dips in a fresh vat. And then we went to three, uh, five one minute dips in a fresh vat. And then we paused, we paused for three days and then we did it again. And as you can see, the difference between fresh and aged three by one minute dips is significant. In person, um, it's even more uh, apparent. And the five minute dip was, you know, you were actually getting five times one minute dip with an age vat. You were getting into kind of medium dark indigo territory and if you had done it immediately after your vat was cool enough to work with, you would be getting a much lighter shade. So we thought that this was pretty, we kind of just, I've sort of known about it intuitively, but we've never done any um, experiments. So this was interesting to me. Um, we did the same thing with the shakalata, a fresh vat, three one minute dips, uh, five one minute dips. And then again, we aged it for three days and we tried it again. As you can see, I think this is a much more dramatic spread between aged and fresh, right? If you look at that, you can see that the fresh is, are these nice lighter mid-tone blues. But once you get into an aged vat, you're actually able to achieve um, a, a darker shade. The other thing, just looking at the, the fabrics below me, there, so I have them here, is that it appears that the age vats also penetrate the fabric better, meaning that the coverage seems to be more even than it was with the fresh vats. So that's something to think about. If, you're, if you are an indigo artist and you're trying to figure out like what, how do you maximize the indigo in your vat, it, it really appears as if, if you can um, age your vats a couple of days or three days that you will get a, a stronger um, color from the same amount of dipping. Um, the henna vat, again, um, henna is kind of an orangish brown color base. And so when you look at like henna tattoos that people wear, it's that kind of beautiful terracotta rust color. Um, it does impart a slight shade to the indigo. So if you look at these in person, you'll see that the indigo is just ever so slightly, I don't know really, it's a little bit browner, but also slightly flatter, if you will. Um, it doesn't quite have that luminous blue, but it's still a really beautiful color. And again, the fresh vats, three and five minutes, are much lighter than the aged vats. And again, all of these vats were aged for um, three days before we uh, redipped. And then finally, iron. Um, I don't, I'm going to show all of the samples side by side, three minute fructose, shake a lot of henna and iron. So you can really see the difference. But iron again, what I noticed is that on the three minute fresh and the three minute uh, the five minute fresh, the coverage is slightly uneven. And again, it's like it didn't quite penetrate but once the vat was aged for three days and we did the dips again, not only were they um, darker, but they were also more even. 
So here's a side by side of all the variables, three minutes fresh, right? So look at that fructose, shake a lot of henna and iron. It, it's a pretty dramatic between iron three minutes and fructose three minutes. The same with uh, a five minute, right? Slightly dark, darker shade, but again, the difference between iron at five minutes versus henna or shakalata or fructose is significant. These are the one uh, aged vats, three minute dips. Again, just a richer shade for the same amount of dipping. And when we say three by one minute dips, what I'm talking about is you put the um, fabric into the vat for a minute, then you remove it, you oxidize it, which means that you let it change color. So it's blue and then you go back in. I don't rinse between dips. I just go back in and I do that three times. So it's three time, one, times one minute dips. And then after that, we fully oxidize and then rinse it. And then the five minute uh, in an aged vat. Again, the difference between fructose and iron or even henna and fructose is pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show you was that the amount of sediment in the vats really varies. So the henna, the shakalata and the fructose vats all had about the same amount of um, sediment, which wasn't a ton. I mean, maybe, maybe a half an inch to an inch on the bottom, but the iron really kind of piled it on. And, and I don't know, I, I think part of it is the iron one, two, three recipe is slightly different in that you use three parts calcium hydroxide instead of two parts. So you are putting more calcium hydroxide in the vat, but it also seemed like it just kind of grew. It was really expanded in the bottom. Um, I'm looking at the iron vat now. It's still got a good uh, two inches of sediment in the bottom. So it maybe it dissipated a, a small amount after um, aging for a couple of months now, but it's still more sedimented than the others. So if you are using an iron vat, you're probably going to want to have the tallest narrowest um, container that you can because you will build up more sediment there. Okay, so that's just kind of my, hold on, let me stop share. That is my talk about what we found out. And then Kate, if you could just go switch to the second um, camera. Okay, good. So I have these laid out side by side. This is, oh, it's weird, it's back. No, it's correct. Fructose. Shakalata, henna, and iron. And if I just take the iron and I put it in between these two, you can kind of see. This is the same amount of dips, just a different vat, right? Three times one minute fresh, five times one minute fresh, three times one minute aged, five times one minute aged. So there, I should probably move this because it's really reflecting. Um, it's really, really evident. So yeah, if you are working in cotton and you are um, really wanting to get super dark colors, I would look at an iron vat as the way to get there. If you are trying to get beautiful gradations and really control your indigo, you would do um, really well with e either of the fructose type vats. And then henna is just, I don't know if you can see that it's, let's see, I'm trying to figure out where, it's much warmer. Can you see that it's got a slight undertone? Like this is much cooler. It's darker, of course, but it's, it's just like, this has kind of a, a warmer shade to it due to the um, henna in it. Um, what else can I tell you about our experiment? Um, Oh, a couple of things that people ask about a lot are like, how do you keep the vat heated? And so I'm gonna show you that, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where. This is a bucket heater. And I bought this uh, online. It's, it's, it's sits in a 
five gallon bucket, there's this, this um, protective shield around the element. So even if it stands up in the bucket, the element isn't touching um, the plastic so it won't melt it. And then we suspend these in larger vats. So we'll put like two um, bungee cords across the top of our vat and make sure it's pretty snug. And then there's a very slight um, kind of like lip here. So you could just suspend it and heat up your vat. And heating these types of one, two, three vats seems to be super helpful. Um, I've heard that iron vats don't need to be heated and I was gonna try and do a cold iron vat experiment but I didn't quite get to it. So it'd be something to just kind of test yourself is do you get the same color from a um, unheated iron vat than you do from a heated iron vat? And when we're talking about heating, we're talking about going to maybe um, 90 degrees um, Fahrenheit, which is I think about 30, two degrees Celsius. So it's not super hot, but just warm enough so that uh, the reaction is continuing uh, in your vat. And I think that's it for my presentation. Um, Amy, do you, it's about 926. Anything else you wanna know about? That yeah, people wanna know so many things already about indigo. But we also have a chat we're going to open up. Okay, so yeah, I thought we could spend quite a bit of time just talking about details. Okay, let's see, let's open this up. So the chat's open, and I'm going to start with the questions that were sent in first, okay? Yep. Are you ready? Dear Kathy. Yes. I have two vexing issues with my indigo dyed fabrics, fading on edges when stored on shelves and two, crocking of threads and yarns. It doesn't seem to matter how much I soak, rinse and finish and which method I use, these things continue to be annoy annoyances. Can you give this person some, um, some information on why that might be happening? Fading on edges, crocking of threads. Um. The edge fading, so I don't see that often, but I do get a lot of people asking me about it. So it must be pretty common. It kind of seems like with the one, two, three vats, the amount of, um, that the calcium hydroxide kind of plays a role and that if it isn't thoroughly cleaned off, that it continues to kind of um, influence the textile. I did, this is pure conjecture. I don't really know, but what I have noticed is that the people that I know really, really clean their textiles well and really wash them, I don't see that kind of fading, no matter how light or how dark. And in fact, I have some, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to pull them out, but I have some very, very light Abu Bakr textiles that are from, something that he calls the blue of nothingness. So it's a very, very weak, very, very old vat. And these, these pieces are probably three to four years old and there's no fading on them. I mean, you can see where it's a lighter shade of indigo. So there's a slight variation on the actual surface of the cloth, but there's no fold line fading um, and there's no crocking. And we have pieces that are dark all the way to you know the darkest of the iron indigos that I showed you just a few minutes ago to something that's just a whisper of a blue. Um, so I think cleaning and getting off that calcium is really important. And what I think people should also realize is that calcium hydroxide, it's like that stuff that's on the inside of your shower or on your um, you know on your faucets, it's that buildup, right? And so I think that if you use a little bit of vinegar in your rinse water at the very end, you dissolve that off. And in fact, I have this kind of pathetic story where I had made my one, two, three vat in a stainless steel pot. And when I discarded it, there was this just crust of 
calcium hydroxide on the inside rim. I could not get it off for the life of me scrubbing. And I ended up throwing the pot away before I realized that if I just put a little bit of vinegar water in there, it would have dissolved it. So I think if you put a little bit of, of, a, of a mild acid, like a like vinegar, um, I always use vinegar just because other acids sometimes react with the natural dyes if you're doing an over dye. So I just try to stay with acetic acid. But when I do that, I notice that first of all, I can get the lime off of the inside of a pot. So therefore it must be coming off of the textile as well. And so it's, it's just a, you know, a final rinse to just make sure you've dislodged all of that. And at that point, your textile should be fairly stable. In terms of threads, um, you know, there's, there's a, it's difficult with thread just because there's so much compression pushing and pulling when you're stitching. So I don't, possibly the vinegar can assist and improve, but I don't know if it'll get rid of all of the crocking. Okay. What is the best way to refresh a vat when it gets weak? Is it better to refresh or start over? This is really a matter of your personal practice. Um, those of us who learn from Abu Bakr, you know, his belief is that uh, a vat has a lifespan. And so therefore at the end of the lifespan, it, the vat is done and you discard it and you set a new vat. There are other people in who have like, um, Carol Shaw Sutton in, at Cal State Long Beach. I mean, her vat was like a quarter of a century old. So she had been able to maintain a vat for many, many, many years and doing it by refreshing. So I don't know that there's a best way. I would say that there's a preference. I do know that with one, two, three, three vats with um, the amount of calcium hydroxide that we use, and especially if you're making a one, two, three and a henna vat, that the amount of sediment on the bottom, if you keep refreshing it, is going to start growing. And at a certain point, you won't have enough room to do an effective dip. So you either, you know, you can reset a new vat and compost what, what was in your old vat. Okay, I am going to go over here to the chat and our friend Sasha has a question. What happens if you leave your fructose vat for two months and temperatures drop to below 60? Will it still be okay if you reheat it? Asking for a friend, of course. Friend asked. <laughs> Not Sasha. Oh no. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, you, you look at your vat and it's just like, uh-oh. But really what I do is I take my heater or you can use a water bath in order to reheat. Um, your uh, vat and just warm it up a little. You, again, you want to get it to, you know, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, so not super hot. And then I stir it, stir it vigorously, like, you know, you stir it in a circular motion and you should see a flower begin to just come up spontaneously. If you don't already have one, there one will develop. And sometimes it's really pale and gray and just wimpy looking. Don't worry, it will come back. <laughs> sometimes it's just like, whoa, it, like they're yellow, you know, the vat, the bubbles are terrible. But if you just do it a couple more times, you'll start to reactivate the vat and you should start seeing that the, that the bubbles, the flower, the, the, the ibana starts to get kind of richer looking, dark, darker. Um, it all depends on the, the, um, the strength of your vat to begin with, but yeah, just keep stirring it and then it'll start to kind of come back. It may take more than just one stir and heat. So you might need to do it over a couple of days and then your vat should start to rebalance because all that stuff that's in the sediment below, that's kind of like, you know, this, this sort of nourishing bed of indigo, fructose, um, calcium hydroxide, and it needs to be reincorporated into the liquid part of your vat and kind of dissipate and reactivate, and then it'll start to bloom. So it, it will come back. I mean, I would not freeze it. If it got, if it froze, you can try defrosting it and seeing if it'll still work, but try to keep it from freezing. Teddy Milder or Milder is asking, why is sedimentation a problem? 
Do you feel like you answered that? I mean, you answered that a little bit. The problem in that when you are dipping, you're trying to keep your goods from diving into that sediment layer because if the sediment layer cakes on the actual fabric, when you pull out your goods and you have these big clumps and streaks of sediment, then those often will not oxidize correctly and you get these funny marks on your goods. And so if you like that kind of look, then you're, you're great. But if you're trying to get a super even, you know, dark or a more of a controlled dip, then you want to avoid that. And um, that's why the sediment, you want to stay out of the sediment. Do you have a prowler? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> not sure. <laughs> Could be the form of a male, male person. <laughs> it's just getting wacky these feedback Fridays. You've got like a hundred questions. So, all right. How much Barbara mm -hmm. says, how much iron are we talking about for a five gallon vat? Um, so this one had uh, 50 grams of indigo, 100 grams of iron and 150 grams of calcium hydroxide. So it's different. It's different than any other one, two, three vat because other one, two, three vats have one part indigo, two parts, of calcium hydroxide and three parts of the reducing agent. So fructose or henna. But in iron, iron is so fast, you know, and so aggressive that you only need two parts of it. Where do you get that heater that you were showing? You can get them online and we can um, drop have a link to that. Okay. Yeah. Indigo heater link. It's got a bucket heater. Um, if you live in a rural area, they're used for keeping the livestock um, water troughs from freezing over. Uh, there's these big ones that like go into the trough, but these are also used for buckets. Can you overheat a vat? I think you can, but so far um, we've, we've sort of forgotten about a vat until it was about 150 degrees. Fahrenheit, and then um, let it cool, stirred it, let it settle, and it was fine. So I would say if you're at a rolling boil, you might have a problem, but we, we've inadvertently overheated our vats and they still work. Okay, Anna Volkman is asking, is there any difference between light and wash fastness between the vats? We're not testing for that, Anna. So I don't know. Um, what I do know is that indigo is the most light and wash fast of the dyes. I think a lot of times light fastness and wash fastness also is super dependent on how you prepare your fabric. So in the case of this fabric, we used off the shelf cotton hankies from Dharma Trading Company. We didn't even scour them. We just wet them out let them soak um, probably for a couple of hours and then wrung them out and started dipping. So yeah, I, if, if we had scoured them and, and done that kind of a thing, maybe we would have gotten a more even uh, result, but we didn't. Rihanna Gilbert is asking, should we stir our vats daily even if not dying with them that day? You don't need to stir them daily if you're not going to be dying with them. Like, so in order to kind of put your vat to bed, let's just say for the winter, all we do is we will stir them, cover them, make sure that they're not gonna freeze. And then when we're ready to revitalize the vat in the, in the you know, a few weeks later, a few months later, a year later, we stir, 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 let it settle. Oh, I'm sorry. We heat, take out the heater, stir, 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 let it settle. And then we run a quick test. And if it looks like the vat is still doing okay and is ready to go, then we start dipping. If, it, if it's looking kind of weak and we know there's a lot of indigo in there, then we'll do the stir, settle, stir, settle a number of times. I mean, it could take four or five times and then your vat kind of starts to re, re uh, wake up and go, oh yeah, I'm here. And then you start getting nice color. Okay, Miss Liz Aston. Hey Liz, would love some troubleshooting tips for reviving a one, two, three fructose fat. What's the trouble? 
troubleshooting tips. Maybe, I don't know, Liz, if Liz wants to unmute herself. Maybe it's just not getting color on uh, on the fabric. If it's really wimpy color and you know there's a lot of indigo, when I say a lot of indigo, I'm talking like 50 to 100 grams in a five gallon bucket, that's a lot of indigo. If there's a lot of indigo in there and you've only used it a couple times and you put it away for a year or two and now you wanna to try to use it again, you definitely need to do the stir settle exercise probably at least two to four times. And then it should start to show you what color it's got left in it. If after, um, you know, you've done this a couple of times and it just won't come back, um, you can try adding more reducing, you know, you're gonna have to look at that liquid. If, if the liquid is dark blue, then you need more reducing agent. If the liquid is just wimpy and kind of grayish and, and it looks actually clear, and you can see it to the bottom of the spoon and you've been stirring it and letting it settle and stirring it and letting it settle. It sounds like that is a, an exhausted vat. Okay, my, my vat was, uh, it was full of indigo, but I think it might've been, I was trying to add more reducing agent and to change the pH. Um, and I just don't think I stirred it enough. Keep stirring it. It's probably yeah. just fine. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple questions on this um, this seasoning and aging, Kathy. Yeah. So I'm gonna try to. So there's one about what. Just hear me out on this one. So what is it about the aging process that improves the color? And when you're aging it, do you keep it? Are you keeping it at 90 degrees for three days? Do you reheat it? So is maybe is the heat and the aging working together. And then um, another person saying, what do you think accounts for the darkening of color with the aged fat? So kind of in natural dyes altogether, a little bit of time often will improve results. So in the case of mordantine, if you mordant something and you let it cure for two or three or four days, and then you do the dyeing, you get a darker color or dyers will leave things in a dye pot overnight in order for the color to strike longer. I think with the indigo vat, because this is a chemical reaction between, let's just say fructose, water, um, indigo, and calcium hydroxide, all of those ingredients, there's, of course, there's an, an initial reaction that happens and it's, it's good, it's strong, but you get even better results if you give it some time to really interact and really fully complete its reaction process. Um, because again, all that stuff is settling to the bottom and it, the, the active ingredients, if you will, are stuck in that sediment. And maybe they're leaching out a little bit during this 72 hour, you know, the three day aging process. I mean, we, we could have done it the next day and gotten the same results. We just don't know. Um, it, it was just, you know, I thought it would be slightly darker or maybe even a little bit more even but we were a little shocked, um, pleasantly shocked at how much richer it was. So I, I think it's just giving the ingredients more time to kind of do their entire reaction so that you get the results. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back to a question that came in online. So this person says, I have an old indigo vat, several years old from back in the day, when I used chemicals to reduce before I learned the one, two, three, it still has lots of indigo in it. So my question is, can I salvage the indigo somehow or convert it to a one, two, three type vat somehow? Um, I think you can, I'm not totally sure. So what I would do is I would check the pH first and make sure your pH is you know, 10, 10 or 11. Uh, and then I would stir it like crazy. It probably doesn't have much hydrosulfite left in it or thiox or whatever you were using, but it should not smell like sulfur. If it smells like sulfur, you're gonna wanna keep stirring it to get rid of as much of that smell as possible. And then I would add fructose. If your pH is good, you have lots of indigo in there, and it really just needs to be reduced, then I would add fructose. 
and you might need to kind of do this over the course of a bit of time because you may have residual chemistry from the diox vat that you were using um, that's in there. And I don't know what you used for your uh, alkali, if you used uh, lye or if you used soda ash or if you actually use calcium hydroxide, um, but that might also impact it a little bit. But again, try reducing it. Um, you would heat it though. So I would check the pH, make sure your pH is good. If your pH isn't good, add some calcium hydroxide and get the, the pH up. And then stir it like crazy to make sure that it's all that residual thiox is out of there. At least it's, it's no longer active. And then finally, um, reduce it, heat it and reduce it. Okay. Could you explain shake a lot again? Yeah, hold on. Oh, no. <laughs> Kathy behind the curtain. I have all these curtains. Okay, so um, I'm going to put it on this camera. So shake a lot of is basically, what does it say? Oh, it says unmute, yeah. Um, oops. Shake a lot of is just a combination of indigo, calcium hydroxide, and fructose all just mixed together rather than mixing each um, ingredient separately, dissolving it separately. So all of this would be mixed into um, together and then added into the vat. And this is again, the method that Scrambles Quilt, Kristen Arts introduced to me. She said it, she got it, the information from Catherine Ellis and Joy Botroop um, from their class in Penland. And they got it from Michelle Garcia. So what we found is that it does, let me see if I can show you. There's a super slight difference in, so this is fructose and this is shakalata. Okay, as you can see, I think you can see. It's kind of hard. I mean, you can see a little bit. This little. is higher than this. So this is a three one minute dip. This is a three one minute dip. And this is lighter than this one. And it's also slightly grayer. Um, this one is lighter than this one. But then as we get to the aged vat, it looks like the shakalata has really just incorporated and they're nearly identical. In fact, this um, five minute aged dip is darker than the fructose one. So it kind of starts a little slower, but it ends up in, in a dark uh, shade in the same place or even better. So that was our observation. Okay. Um, my banana fructose vat works perfectly well, but has little to no flour. Why could this be? You know, different vats will give different flowers. Like the henna vat and the indigo, uh, the iron vat are just like these huge flowers come off of the vat. But the fructose vat can be pretty flat. And in fact, even not even have any um, flower at all and just kind of like a tiny sprinkling of bubbles. Don't worry about that. It's really, really, if your vat is performing well and you're getting great color, I would not worry about the flower. All right. Okay. Hi, Eva. Is the one, two, three ratio the same for henna? Yes. It's one part indigo, two parts calcium hydroxide, and three, tar three parts henna. The deal with henna is that it is it kind of expands a lot, so it's quite bulky and it's very goopy. And so if you just throw it into your vat, you're gonna have this ball of henna at the bottom that is almost impossible to dissolve. So we actually dissolve it in a separate small bucket and we strain it, you know, with a wire strainer so that any of the fibers or any of that kind of henna goop is dissipated before we add it into the vat. And Kate, I'm pretty sure that we um, show that, right? In our illustrations of the information. Yeah, we, we documented the straining of it. That was definitely the hardest 
ingredient to make sure that we had fully dissolved and incorporated of all four vats. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, so Debbie Ellis is asking, so are you heating the vat continuously or are you heating up after a period of sitting? We heat it only when we're gonna use it. So okay. it, heat the vat, get it to, you know, get it to 90 degrees and then remove the heater, stir the vat, let it settle, start, check it, right? Do a test and then start dipping. I don't mm -hmm. keep it heated the entire time. Mm -hmm. This is probably the most important question or a statement. Um, Heidi Iverson just wants you to know, Kathy, it's Nomad Botanicals re Replenishing Oil, Mad Hippie for face cream and eye cream and lip stuff, mi and Mineral Fusion Lip Tint, so. You. Is Mad Hippie in Portland? <laughs> I don't know, These, everybody else is gonna kill us for that one. Thanks, Heidi, we'll, we'll, we'll go to that. Um, Okay, can you please talk about ratios of water, fructose, and indigo into the vat? Yes, um, we actually have this super uh, detailed explanation of trying to figure out like if you want a light vat, if you want a medium vat, or if you want a dark vat, like how much indigo do you use and what size container? And so the way that we've broken it down is to have you um, do calculations based on the amount of indigo, for the amount of water. And we characterize this as grams per liter. So grams of indigo per liter of water. For those of you who don't live in metric land, a, quart, a, a liter of water is approximately a quart. It's a little bit more, but it's, it's, all, you know, it's roughly a quart of water. So if all you have is quart measurements, you can use the quart um, as your measurement and you'll still be within the ballpark of what these vats produce. And the reason we're doing it this way is because when we were doing the spoonful method, which is what I first learned, I found out that some people, you know, a spoonful for some people is like three grams of indigo and a spoonful for other people is like 20 grams. And so even though the um, measurements are consistent, that people were getting inconsistent results and, or people were putting three grams of indigo into a five gallon uh, bucket and getting nothing because there's not enough indigo in there. So we, we backed it down to how many, how many liters could a five gallon container hold comfortably and how many grams of indigo. So we have these tables in the new instructions that say if you want um, a media, like these, all of our samples were done with um, 50 grams of indigo in a five gallon container. And so as you can see, we got some pretty dark shades, especially with iron and the vats are still good. And that is, I think three grams per liter of indigo. So was that correct, Kate? Were we at three or two? Uh, I'm double checking now because I can't remember. Yeah, none of <laughs> 3.1, right? So we are at three grams. So it's kind of like a medium to dark vat. So yeah. it was just over three grams per liter. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. Thank you. Um, so anyway, the because you're using um, three grams per liter and you know how many liters you have, you can kind of calibrate how light or how dark your vat's going to be. So you can scale this up all the way to a 50 gallon barrel or you can scale it down to a one quart, um, a one quart kind of test vat if you wanted to. So there's lots of ways to do it. And we're just trying to give you the flexibility to be able to create the size of vat that works for you. Obviously a five gallon vat is good for something that's about the size of a bandana, or if you're doing shibori, a small shibori piece, but you couldn't put um, much much more volume size, I suppose, area size. You couldn't put large, you couldn't put a bed sheet in there. Um, you, could, you couldn't even put a bath towel in there and get really good consistent color. So you are gonna wanna size your vat for the kind of work you do. If you're doing you know, large pieces of fabric, something like this, you're gonna need a large vat, like at least, 
40 gallons. So like a 50 gallon barrel would be great. Um, of course, that's an investment in indigo and ingredients, but if that's what you're trying to do, you're trying to get one large piece dipped and you have a, a number of those, then that is um, something that you could use. And all of these buckets, barrels, containers, um, we're using standard five gallon buckets for our five gallon. Um, there's also seven gallon buckets that are available. And that then once you move to like 10 gallon and above, there's a whole bunch of different kind of trash cans and fairly heavy duty um, containers that you can use that will hold a vat really nicely. I hope that answered your question. Okay, um, can you please talk about ratios? Oh, sorry, sorry. Is there any water treatment required? Is, is there a difference between hard and soft water, water pH, et cetera? I haven't noticed a difference. And in Seattle, we have extremely soft water. It's non-mineralized um, because we've leached out, you know, all of our water is, is uh, glacial water. So it's, it doesn't have like the limestone and, and magnesium that groundwater has. Um, but I haven't noticed a huge difference between groundwater and um, our water, except that possibly groundwater is, a, has, you know, because it has a slightly richer mineralization, might either, it, it could very well react um, better, right? This is something I wonder about too. Nadine Allen is asking, what can I do about yellow brown residue streaks that appear on indigo dyed from the 123 vat fabric after it's dried? I don't think you're rinsing it enough. Oh. <laughs> Good Lord, are you? <laughs> this is where the story begins that we're all witness to. So everybody remember what's happening. Um, Kate, what do you do? Kathy's got to get the mailman's <laughs> so people get orders completed. Oh, there we go. My favorite FedEx person. They're so great. <laughs> All right. So, no, so just not rinsing enough for that yellow brown residue. So, I mean, it, it, you can check if you've been modifying your vat a lot and like adding, you know, adding a lot of fructose or adding a lot of calcium, I definitely check your pH, right? And make sure you're, you're not wildly off somewhere there. But if you're getting like this big fade and kind of yellowish streak, most of that is there's still stuff on the garment or the fabric that is still reacting. Mm -hmm. So you want to get that off. Yeah, you can learn a lot about your fabric and the junk that's on it just by dyeing. Yeah, if it's an over dye thing, um, we did a little, oh, I know what I did. I, I had an over dye linen jacket and I let it somehow, did something with it with a henna vat and all the henna went to the folds of the jacket and, and just showed themselves on the surface. So I had these big watercolor brown stripes all over everything. So, you know, it may be that the henna is also kind of like expressing itself. I would then move to like a fructose vat or something that has less of a color story underneath so that it's not um, doing that on your fabric. Mm -hmm. I think that's, yeah, I think you're, that's exactly what's happened to me, Kathy. When I did the, those brown spots, it was with a henna vat. Mm -hmm. Okay, when do you use vinegar in the washing process? So what I'll do is I'll rinse off most of the blue, you know, like the first two or three um, rinses are pretty laden with excess blue. And then once I'm kind of past that, I'll just draw a bucket of water, put in some vinegar. And I mean, it's a small amount. It's couple of tablespoons all the way up to maybe half a cup. I mean, it's not a ton. Stir it around, it's cold water, it's just regular water. And then I put the textile in there and I let it soak. And I'll just kind of, if it's cotton or something that won't felt, I'll, I'll agitate it pretty strongly in there just to kind of 
get that get the in there and then i let it sit for anywhere from 20 minutes to a long time because i forget about it then i come back and i just finish rinsing it and hang it okay christine hegel hi christine uh can can you run through the finishing processes i have notes to to soak in lye water after soap water not quite sure what this lye is so lye is a super strong alkali and it's actually dangerous to handle i mean you need to have ppe in order to handle it because it um you don't want to breathe the powder from lye powder and if you're using a lye liquid, you don't wanna get splashed by it. It's highly corrosive. You need to wear eye protection, um, at least a mask, dust mask of some sort and gloves. Um, but lye water, I'm not sure why you would, it, possibly you could use a slightly alkali solution um, to soak your textiles in, but we've found that we have residual calcium and it may because be because we're using really short vats and there's a lot of calcium in them and we keep storing up the calcium. And so it embeds itself in the fabric. Maybe someone with a much taller, larger vat has less of a problem and they don't see that. But we use the vinegar, the slightly acidic um, liquid in order to dissolve the last of that residual calcium. Otherwise we can even this. Okay, because in that recipe, or if what I wrote down, that was actually first wash in soap water a few times and then wash in lye water, soak in lye water for one hour, and then again in fresh water and then vinegar also. Um, yeah, I don't know what the lye step is for Christine. Yeah. Sorry, you, you think uh, soap is enough and then. Okay, so um, soap is yeah. alkaline as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, because you're right. Thank you. Yeah. Avoid the lye if you can. Yeah, it sounds crazy. Yeah, I don't yeah. like it. <laughs> you. Uh, Kathy, there are about 52 more messages that I'm looking at, and it's 101. Okay. What do you want to do? Um, <laughs> you want to answer one or two more? Because there's a lot of questions that are probably have already, because we answer questions about indigo yeah. pretty much around I'm over some that you've, I've, I've definitely seen that you've answered, but you know, there's one there's I'm looking at. links to, um, um, you know, the earlier blog posts that we've done that probably yeah, answer so. many of those questions. So we can give you the, all those links so that you can peruse them yourself. Um, the other thing is the the other important thing is that the instructions on making a one two three vat with kind of our new methods is going to be online this weekend. So once we have that published and this video published, um, you will have all the information you need to try this yourself. Kathy, I want to. I've I've been wanting to do this to show people, but I want to. I want to see if I can do this, like share the screen and just show our site, like how you can find things on our site about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Are you co we, we didn't practice this. Okay. Okay. Even when I practice, it doesn't. Matter. Okay. So you guys, when you go on our site, you can go over here to the search and you'll see search products or search the blog. So of course you can search products, put, put in Indigo. And when you put in Indigo and hit return, you're going to see all kinds of stuff that's all indigo on our site. But if you hit this and you hit the blog and you look for indigo, then a lot of our, when we didn't do this live, when it was just blog posts, there's indigo facts, there's hints and tips, there's so much indigo help, like indigo roundup of indigo dying questions. There's so much, so much indigo stuff here for you to get, for you guys to look over. So really utilize a site. It's like our, it's like a little library that you you need to tap into, and um, and then you can get lots of different answers to your questions. And we can take, I can we can have you answer some of the questions, Kathy, from the chat after. Yes. And I can add them in and make a new roundup of Feedback Friday questions too. Okay, great. Um, so let's go ahead and wrap this up because it is a little bit after the hour. 
Um, just some reminders for you, and then I'll let you know who we have as our special guest next week. Um, first of all, thank you, you guys. This was really helpful. Oh, the kids are here. Okay. What is happening? We have a, they have like a extracurricular art class in the facility. And so then there's like these hordes of children that come screaming through every, about every hour. It's great. Um, we just posted a, a class with um, Sasha Durr and we're really excited about this. It's going to be held in uh, January. I think it's January 9th and 10th. Is that right? 9th and 10th? Good Good it's the weekend. Um, and what um, Sasha's going to be doing is we'll be providing fabric and also two dyes, uh, Himalayan rhubarb root, so not the extract, but the actual root, and then um, I think matter, those two. And then Sasha's going to have you forage your holiday decorations. <laughs> so pine cones, um, citrus peels, pomegranate peels, um, cedar boughs, any Douglas fir, anything that you have left over from holiday. Um, she's going to show us how to get color from that. And we'll be using the concepts from her book, Natural Palettes, and creating four different colors from one dye. So this is going to be like super exciting. Um, and we invite you to join us for that one. Um, and what else? Oh, Car Marie Piazza. Good friend. She went away again. <laughs> the small studio. Good luck, Kathy. Cara Marie has this really beautiful new um, die kit that she's um, selling on our site. So that's exciting. That's online. Um, Amy says, any new dyes you'd like to promote? Yeah, I, I, we do have new dyes coming, but I don't have them ready, so I'm not going to promote anything. Let's just talk about our next week's guest, who is Tali Weinberg. Um, Tali is this amazing artist who utilizes weaving, sculpture, thread drawing, and works on paper to visualize climate data. And so she did this set of weavings that showed like how over time temperatures have been rising. Um, she did that one. She did one that was like paper weaving that was just really beautiful. So Tali is going to be um, with us next week. She draws on the history of weaving as a subversive language for women and marginalized groups to create a feminist material archive in response to worsening climate crisis. Her works merge practices of record keeping with practices of grieving and merge expressions of scientific research with expressions of lived experience. Through sculpture, drawing, and textiles using natural dyes, she traces relationships between climate change, water, extractive industries, illness, and displacement. This is gonna be really, really fascinating and I'm looking forward to it. She's so incredible. Um, the other thing I'm just gonna give a quick plug for is that right now Fibershed in, um, has their annual wool symposium online. And I believe you can still buy tickets. It goes through tomorrow and the sessions are being recorded. So you can um, purchase a ticket now and drop in and get recordings for the sessions that you miss. But um, the lineup has just been incredible. Um, yesterday they had a fire yeah. Talk with Dr. Elizabeth um, Johnson. So that was just amazing to hear a marine biologist speak about the need for both um, a Green New, New Deal or issues with land um, stewardship and climate and the importance of also having oceans uh, involved. Okay, I'm going to end it there. Um, we can open it for um, hellos, goodbyes, etc. cetera. Um, Amy, anything else? <laughs> Uh, so, something in there, and yeah. a lot of times the money isn't there, so you got to hang on. To all it right. Paper. Well, we covered, covered it all. Those were the, all right. the two handy dandy, dandy checklist. The checklist. We're, we're good. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Hi, Greece. Thank you. Bye. Hey, Kathy. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.